The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. We move in spasms. My brothers, because they are conjoined at the frontal lobe, and me, because for me there is no other way to continue moving. So begins Tom Picciarelli's A Choir of Ill Children, which is what we'll be discussing on... Dread Dialectic. Dread Dialectic. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the inaugural episode of Dread Dialectic. This is Michael T. Bradley. This is Skix Maddox. And we are going to talk to you today uh, about uh, a little bit of background. First, the kind of impetus for the show. Then we're going to get into reviewing one horror book. And we'll get into some more about kind of our reasons for picking things and what we'd like to try to do in the future towards the end uh, during the wrap-up. But for right now, first, I thought it would be interesting to talk about kind of where this came from. The landscape seems littered with a lot of really good podcasts and YouTube channels and everything that look at horror games and horror uh, movies, uh, especially. But I, I noticed a dearth of horror literature being looked at, and I get it. It's it's the slowest thing to engage with. Uh, it, it, it takes longer to read a novel than to play a game, at, at least enough to get a feel for the game or to watch a movie, so it, it's possible that this won't be coming out bam, bam, bam. But it, it is a, a part of the genre and something that I think is worth looking into. So that's kind of where this came from. I thought it might be interesting to kind of give you a little bit of background from each of us on kind of how we came into horror literature and why we have an interest in it. Uh, Skix, if you want to go ahead and go first there. Well, I was doomed from the start because I was born in a small town in Maine, 20 to 30 <laughs> minutes away from where Stephen King resides in his den of darkness. Is growing up in Maine kind of like growing up under an alcoholic parent? Like you, you either are... <laughs> Like, you're either going to become an alcoholic or shy away from it completely? Yeah, I, 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 I think a little bit like that. Um, Stephen King, I mean, despite the fact that he's what everybody knows, is not the biggest cultural influence in the state. But he, he is one. I always thought, growing up, he was just a local guy for Mainers to like. I had no idea he had national and international fame. Actually, until I moved out of Maine as an adult... He was just local boy makes good to me. And, you know, we were pleased. I, I met him once at a, a at a book signing. I did not start out being into horror. I was a genre snob. I read science fiction because it was smarter. But yeah. uh, uh, somewhere along the way, uh, little bits of horror started sneaking into my, uh, into my cultural input and uh, grew on me, and now I write the stuff. I love the games, I love the movies, I even like the bad ones, and we will cover some bad ones in this series, I <laughs> am sure. Right now, I actually do some live-action horror. I work at a haunted house, and I train zombies and vampires and ghouls to be scary. So for me, I was a reader from very early on. I taught myself to type on an old keyboard in a suitcase <laughs> that my mother had and would sit in the back of a store typing out ridiculous little stories on that when I was like seven or something. And I, I remember reading my first novel, uh, then again, maybe I won't uh, when, I don't know, maybe first grade or something. But, but horror just never, I, I guess it always seemed so adult, right? Like it just seemed kind of off, off limits somehow or something. Mm -hmm. But when I was, I wanna say nine or 10, somewhere in there, uh, a kind of friend of the family knew how interested I was in books, and she gave me Misery of Kings Ooh, to borrow. That's a little old and, for that age. In any case, she gave me that, and I I just absolutely loved it. I mean, I, you know, I was twisted, dark, young kid, and uh, <laughs> uh, loved, loved, like, that... The, somebody could write something like this and kind of get away with it, you know what I mean? Like, like they paid somebody to be dark and twisted, like, I'm constantly... Uh, like in my head and so and then I read it and it was my favorite book for many many years because uh, you know for so many reasons like I was I was right at the age that they are in the flashbacks and and I remember it had to be before I was 12 when I got into things because 
Uh, I was 12 when the It movie came out, and at that point I had read the books, book a couple of years earlier, and I remember being so excited about the movie and then so let down. But Yeah, join the club. That's a review for a different podcast. More and more, like, as I got older, I discovered the movies, and I used to love horror of any sort, uh, uh, good or bad. Then, almost exactly ten years ago to the day now, uh, we're recording this on April 5th, 2017, I, I had a, a really, like, horrible personal tragedy, and I won't get into that. This isn't, like, therapy session, but because of that, I just completely lost my taste for horror. Like, it just all the people that I enjoyed reading and all the stuff that I enjoyed watching just wasn't entertaining anymore. And it took me maybe five or six years to get back into being okay with watching movies again. And only recently have I started to gain a passion for uh, the literature again and reading it again. That was kind of the the birth of this, so thanks for listening and thanks for joining. And and I'll mention this a few times throughout the podcast, but of course, for recommendations and more, uh, again, I'll, I'll pimp out this some more at the end, but, um, you know, any sort of feedback, please write to us. Dread Dialectic, with a period in between, so dread.dialectic at gmail.com. And uh, we, we'd love to hear your feedback, we'd love to hear your thoughts, and I'm probably going to put this on YouTube as well, so feel free to just comment there. Let's go ahead and start with the first book that we're going to look at. This episode we're talking about A Choir of Ill Children by, probably going to pronounce this wrong, by Tom Picciarelli. It's a very poetic title. Yeah. Let's begin with just a basic plot synopsis. If, 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 do you want to do that for us, Skix? Uh, so, it takes place in the swamps, in the town of... King- Kingdom Come. Kingdom Come. Somewhere in the south. It probably says specifically, but it, you know, swampland. Our narrator is part of a wealthy family that owns the mill. His brothers are three conjoined twins, conjoined at the frontal lobe, which means they sort of share thoughts as well as part of their body, I guess? Yeah. But uh, over the course of the story... Trouble just keeps happening over and over of various sorts, and the witch women, the the sort of witches, keep trying to come to the narrator and saying, "You gotta do this, or you know, save us all." And and these mysteries start piling up and piling up, and it's possible to read it with there not really being any real supernaturalness, except for a couple maybe seeing the future moments. And our protagonist kind of tries to just sort of get through, you know, paying some people off and tromping around in the swamp trying to find his past and trying to protect his uh, his brothers and the various people in his life. You know, by the end, we're, we're pretty clear he's not a nice guy. Our protagonist is not... I don't think he... I think it's fair to say he's not really the hero of the story. He's just the protagonist of the story. Yeah, for sure. I think that sums it up, and, and we'll talk about... Thomas there, the the narrator in a second. He's not really an obtuse narrator, but anyway, we'll talk about him in a second. The format we're going to try for here is after the basic plot synopsis, we're going to go through the good, the bad, and the ugly. Good being things that we liked about it, bad being things we didn't like about it, and the ugly being the monster, since this is uh, about, uh, this is a horror uh, literature exploration, and in uh, the ugly, when we get to that section, there will be spoilers. Before that section, we're going to try to keep it as kind of general and vague as possible, so hopefully listening to the first two parts will get you excited to read something, then you can pause it, go read it, come back, and listen to the end. But for now, let's let's go ahead and jump into the good. I'll just go ahead and say that the reason that I... Uh, because I, I picked this book, and the reason that I chose it was because I had read Picciarelli's A Lower Deep years ago and just loved it. And I just remember the language really pulling me in. And it was absolutely the same with this one. It, it I, I think doing any sort of plot synopsis is so difficult because I don't really know what the hell this book is about. I mean, it's just kind of like some days go by, some things happen. There's the dog kicker subplot. There's the carnival <laughs> subplot. But it's like, it's not, it doesn't uh, really such a have... a herring, the dog kicker. It doesn't really have a plot, per se, you know? It's just kind of like... Thomas is a wealthy guy in a small town in Mississippi and weird shit happened. And I'm okay with that, but but what I loved is just the language. It is lyrical in a sense that most books aren't. And I normally when somebody says a book is lyrical, I immediately roll my eyes and I'm like, oh, that's going to be terrible, you know, because right. it's going to be like 
the the you know the wind soughed through the sawgrass in the gentle summer and it's it's not like that at all there are a lot of different bits that i could tell you about i i while i was reading this i kept kind of like uh taking pictures of different parts and sending them to people the two bits that i highlighted there's one that i think is just so brilliant this comes very early on so thomas and his brothers live in this very large house and at the beginning of the story, there's a film crew, like a, uh, but they're like college students or, under, or graduate students doing a story about the location, essentially. And he describes the girl who's kind of spearheading the project. She's the kind of girl who might smuggle hashish in the binding of DM Thomas's The White Hotel. And I just thought that was the funniest damn thing because I'm like, it tells you so much about her character, but it tells you much more about Thomas, right? Right. That he is so judgmental that he thought of this very specific burn to give her, and he knows what DM Thomas's The White Hotel is. I don't know what it is, but it's obvious that, like, he thinks he's better than everyone else because he knows what it is, right? Yeah. There's a, there are a lot of things with Thomas through the book. I, I don't know if he's supposed to be psychic or just incredibly intuitive but a lot of times he has conversations with people and he describes what they're thinking and how they're responding to it like as if he knows more than yeah, it's, it's kind of a, a trick of first person narration where if uh, if the narration covers details that the the first person shouldn't know then where are is is the writer just fucking up the the point of view or or does our narrator actually know stuff I, and, and, and I think, on the whole, Thomas knows stuff. It's not necessarily psychic. I think he's just really good at reading people. Th that's, that's the impression that I got as well. That it wasn't like a supernatural thing. It's just that he's so used to being ten times smarter than everyone around him that he can read them like nobody's business, right? He's this guy who should be somewhere else right he should be like on wall street or something because he's really smart and he's really good at manipulating people and instead he's kind of stuck in this backwoods and he kind of hates everybody around him i mean it's definitely love hate because he has yeah an affection for the place and for his his brothers especially when outsiders are are about he's he's protective of his people even if his people hate him some of them do the mill workers and his brother for a little while? I mean, I think uh, damn near everybody hates him at some point. I can't remember yes. the character's name, but it's something bizarre, like Biddle or whatever. The uh, the priest's son, who was uh, his best friend, you know? It's um, plural. It's like Mads or Bads or Puds. Or... Yeah, yeah. Our, um, our very own magical Negro for the story, by the way. Yeah, yeah. And Andy, I, I don't know. Like, I, I kind of wanted more with that character, but... Whatever. I did. Too. There was a lot of that in the book. There were characters who were interesting sketches that I actually would have liked to know more of their story. It, it kind of in ways felt like a pilot to, um, I don't know, like an HBO series or something, right? Um, yeah. And I say HBO because there's a, a lot of bizarre sex in this. I, I, I would say graphic, but it's not just graphic sex. It's sex where you're like, wait, what? Where she she doesn't have a face and she's writing words into your thigh and you might be asleep or maybe not and it's a little bit rapey and there's actually a lot of a little bit rapey. <laughs> this is this, that's the subtitle of this book. A little bit rapey, um, <laughs> but like yeah, it's so like I have I, I don't think I've ever read um, a sex scene like that where somebody's receiving oral sex and describing the way that like the looping g's that she's writing in his skin as she and does then she it. started using more semicolons <laughs> it's very weird it's not sexy at all but no. it's 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 very graphic uh but it it fits it's just it's like everything else in this novel i i say it fits mostly because like seriously i feel like aliens could have landed and as long as thomas just kept describing it in this weird lackadaisical lyrical manner i would have been okay with it it's somewhere between occult and sordid um, and, and i think <laughs> the whole story kind of happens in that zone yeah yeah i could go for that here's the other quote that i uh, put down someone possibly me wants to murder <laughs> someone else again possibly me 
Right, yes, that was a good turn of phrase. It's like an Ouroboros, just it's kind of like eating itself there, so. And very funny as well, like there's the section about the fish. Me and Dieter went down there once, a few years back, after the insurance settlement came through for when we caught the game warden illegally tapping our phones. This over the largemouth bass incident again. Completely different set of circumstances, Verbal. And that was, for, for those who follow TV Tropes, uh, that's the noodle incident. Because it's never explained, and it's not really part of the story. But it's just kind of a funny note, and it helps develop the sketch of this oddball character, which they're all oddball characters. Uh, I mean, people who start out looking like they might be the ordinary character that everyone else is contrasting against, they, they, they're just as weird in their own way. Like, the, the, the filmmakers are... They're not ordinary. About as clear-cut a case of criminal search and seizure as you're likely to find. Them carp was in the tub for Rosh Hashanah, a traditional <laughs> Jewish holiday, and for no other reason than that, despite what they might say. You a Jew? I was going through a phase. That's, like, it's, it's, it's funny, it's weird, it's sorted, yada 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 yada. To me, everything that's good about this book revolves around the language. He gave me the title, I got the, the book, and I started reading it without, you know looking at descriptions or looking at cover art or anything. I was planning to just read enough of the first page to get kind of a handle of what, what's there and then go to bed. And I just kept going and going and going. Not because stuff was happening, but because it was fun to read. Everything's just odd. It, I mean, it, yeah. And, and odd can keep me going for a long time. I do eventually get You know, I'm sure this will come happens, up again, but, uh, but I have always said about damn near anything that the biggest sin most forms of art, I, there are probably some exceptions, but most forms of art can make for me is, is to be boring. Agreed. So I'm, I'm going to take that to segue into the bad, if you will. Yes, yes. Uh, this is, I, I would say its biggest problem is that really nothing happens in this book. I mean, like, there are a few things, and, like, the dog kicker subplot gets resolved. But it's a letdown resolution, I mean, I thought. I was, I was happy with the resolution, but I get what you're saying. It's not really, like... It's not at all what you would expect. The narrator at some point says, essentially, he, he lists all the subplots. Says these are all tied together somehow. And and you believe him, because he's that kind of character, and he's wrong. <laughs> the subplots do not tie together. Yeah, it's I, I think that is the biggest... I don't want to call it a problem, because it didn't bother me, but I think that's the thing that might turn people off from this story, is that it's it's really just character studies and a day-in-the-life slice. It's not... It's not necessarily like a plot-driven story. I mean, you, you, you could say that there is a plot, and the plot is this guy looks for a mystery and finds his family. And you, you could say that's, that's the gist of the story, and it would be true, but it would be really misleading. <laughs> Yeah, and and like like for instance the you know like the the brothers uh, his conjoined brothers uh, I I believe they leave at one point I don't even remember yeah. how that was yeah. resolved like that's how it kind of gone just one day yeah and just everything is is kind of like that everything just kind of passes through and it's like well whatever I mean I just kind of felt like you could throw anything at me and I'd be okay with that you mentioned the brothers and and that's that's one of my bads they're they're set up as an interesting grotesque. Right? Uh, mm. we've, we've got the, these conjoined triplets. We know that's not a thing. Conjoined by the, the forebrain. We know that's not a thing with successful living people. And, and, and it's set up sort of affectionately. Sort of like, here's my, my, my freak, but I love him. Yeah. But the three, it's like the, the author wants them to have three different personalities, but they all kind of talk at the same time. And I couldn't keep track of which one was the angry one, which one was the poetic one, and which one was the one that was in love. And they were treated like an object. I don't know. They're, they're, they were slightly more interesting than a house pet because they they sort of prophesied a little sometimes. Yeah. And they had sex with Dodie, which is weird. <laughs> if, if you actually visualize some of the things that the author describes that, that the brothers did, their, their foreheads must be made of rubber. Because, yeah. you know, it's just impossible. I personally would like very much uh, with, with the brothers, uh, the author decided that show don't tell isn't a thing. So he would say, yes, and then this brother was speaking angry words, and this brother was speaking poetry, and, and I sort of get what he's going for, but it makes them not people to me. Hmm. I would like to have heard some of their dialogue. I mean, they very rarely spoke in direct quotation. Except for the poetry, right? I mean, there was a lot of poetry in there. Uh, was there? Because he talked about the poetry a lot more than he recited any. 
I, I remember a lot of the poetry because I remember thinking, this is terrible poetry and it's not very romantic. Well, yes. And and the, the sort of love... Oh god, not a love triangle, is it? A love dodecahedron with with Dodie and the filmmaker and the brothers, or one of the brothers. Just confusing? I don't, I don't think it added... I'll admit, I felt like Thomas viewed everyone in the town as an object. Yeah, um... And, and, and maybe it's just because the brothers didn't get to move or act very much that uh, that they felt that way to me uh, more than some of the characters. I, I I think certainly fair point. Passingly, we said that that um, it's a bit rapey, and it is. I mean, when she's like specifically saying "don't" and he does, that that's that's all the way rapey. But it's treated <laughs> as if it's not all the way know? rapey. Yeah, I mean, it's treated as if it's no big thing, you know. Um, so I, I get the, the feeling that, that Thomas, if not the writer, uh, watched some old movies where the man forces a kiss and the woman kind of melts into him. What you said at the beginning, that Thomas is not a nice character, you know, and, and again, I think he views everyone as objects, and I think he feels like he's kind of owed sex from everyone, you know? So, uh, I mean, there are constantly him talking about how he's kind of tempted all the time. Including um, the content warning, uh... We got some uh, pedophilia mentions going on, particularly around Eve, who was described as being eight when they first found her, and she's 19 by the time they get to the end of the book. Yeah. So she's, she's not aging, but apparently she's doing some sort of Lolita act. But when, when Thomas thought she was eight or nine, he sort of casually said, geez, I, I wonder if um, so-and-so has slept with her yet. I wonder what that would be like. And then later, when it's discovered the P.I. has been sleeping with her while she's doing her Lolita act, the P.I. feels guilty because he thinks that makes him a pedophile, and maybe it does, but he's also a murderer, which I think is more important in this particular instance. Thomas says, he's afraid he is what I am. And that's directly after talking about, is he a pedophile for, for wanting to, to screw Eve? I, I reread that a few times. It, seems to be pretty clearly Thomas saying that he's a pedophile. Or that he's amoral, perhaps? That he doesn't, that, that nothing's off the table, I think? I, I, that's the way I read it, that it's like, he's afraid that he's like me in the sense that he just kind of takes what he wants. Maybe. I, I, the whole EU story was, I found, really distressing. <laughs> so let's talk about the ugly, uh, meaning the horror elements, which kind of doesn't fit as much with this book because there's not like there, there's not like a monster at the end uh, that we have to face I except in uh, a really metaphorical sense I, I'm, I'm kind of gonna go a bit more grotesque and disturbing rather than horrifying because that I think that's what the book lives on uh, again this is just gonna be the time to discuss spoilers uh, so if, if you if you don't want the ending spoiled, Stop now and uh, uh, come back. Uh, uh, come back after you've read the book if if you're intrigued. So the big, you know, the kind of the big search uh, throughout this story is uh, is for the dog kicker. No, it's is uh, uh, it, it keeps is this carnival that keeps being brought up. I, I felt like that was kind of the big. What the hell does that mean? And there's this carnival that keeps getting mentioned, and he's told you're gonna need to talk to the to the to the geek to the geek at the carnival, and you're gonna have to give mm -hmm. them the price of. Uh, you know, give him six bits and yada, yada, yada. And one of the things, this God, it's all over the place because everything in this book is connected. But I, I kept thinking, this book kept making me feel like I was reading Faulkner because I feel like Faulkner does a lot of that kind of almost putting motivation in lacunae so that, like, you have to intuit why people do things at times and figure out why they're doing it as opposed to why they say they're doing it, things like that. I mean... Even our first-person narrator, we... we... You're not given clear motive for most of his actions. And also, much like Faulkner, there's a big feeling of kind of genealogy, lineage, uh, things like that being important. And the, uh, Thomas's father is brought up over and over and over again for many different reasons. And we find out that Thomas's father is the geek at this traveling carnival that the swamp people put on. And he had faked his death, uh, and and he, he lost three limbs in in the in a machine at the mill tended to have died, ran off, hobbled off, and somewhere along the line became a roaring alcoholic carnival geek. And the woman he's sleeping with, who's is Thomas's wife, 
Yeah. But is, I believe, the only woman in this entire book who Thomas never has sex with. Which is weird. She's using his shoes to kick dogs. That's there. We spoiled the dog kicker mystery for you. The entire town is terrorized by the dog kicker, which is, is, is I, I think, a much more comedy than horror. Right, right, yeah. And so apparently this, this young lady, or woman, with oversized shoes is just walking around town, kicking all the dogs and not getting caught. It's so strange because it's it's more magical realism, I think, than supernatural. Yes, yes I agree. And and so I just didn't feel shocked by anything, you know, like the fish with Rosh Hashanah and whatever. It was like, okay, whatever. <laughs> but honestly, the moment when his dad's revealed to be the geek, I was I was pretty shocked. Uh, I I really kind of felt that like a, a body blow. I just honestly thought that his dad kept getting mentioned because it's like, this is why Thomas is so fucked up. This is why he can't see people as real people. This is why he is all, he's kind of borderline sociopath most of the time. And then finding out that the reasons, because it was building up to his dad actually being still alive, like I was, I was honestly pretty shocked. That's an example of one of the subplots. And, and this, this happens with, with most of the subplots. When it gets its resolution, it fails to deliver something it promised. So he was told, Thomas was told, what, to talk to the geek, give him some money, and the geek would tell him something he needed to hear, right? Yeah. So Thomas finds out it's his father, and so that's a revelation. But his father doesn't speak to him because he's so damn drunk he can't even recognize him. And it's just sort of left. And Thomas says, well, next year I'll do it again. It really made me wonder, like, is the thing that he needs to find out from him just that he's alive? Is it that the thing that he needs to find out is that he's never going to tell him anything that will give him closure and he just needs to move past it? You know, it's again, it's like you're not given an answer. So you have to figure out, is there an answer here? What is it? The primary witch woman at one point says there are more questions in this life than answers. And, and I think that's an underlying theme of the, the last third of the book definitely at the end here i want to just kind of say would we recommend this i wholeheartedly would recommend this to just about anyone i would recommend it uh but i would give content warnings to anyone that i know would have might have trouble with some of the some of the contents all right fair enough though i i guess i feel like if we're talking about you know uh, horror genre they're, they're probably going to be triggers throughout all of it right i mean it's gonna be sure i mean there, there's some stuff you expect though i mean you expect blood and slashers and stuff but but you, you might be thrown for a loop by someone kicking a dog or by rape or by like i i get extra squicked by eyeball stuff for some reason yeah so i appreciate it if someone says yeah there's some eyeball stuff and so i'm ready for it it's not <laughs> One of the things that I want to say that I want to be very clear on here, and I'll I'll put it at the beginning of the next one because I stupidly saved it till after the uh, spoiler uh, uh, alert stuff here, but is that one of the things we would like to do is try to maybe not 100% focus on it, but uh, definitely seek out uh, more representational uh, horror, uh, horror from not necessarily just white guys. Because there are a lot of white guy horror authors. There are, you know, we white guys, so there many. are a lot of us. Um, <laughs> and uh, and But that's something that we'd like to uh, look for. And so whether you're a white guy or not, but uh, uh, especially like if, if you feel like you, you're maybe overlooked by a lot of other places, for sure we would love to uh, take a look at things uh, that people send to us. Um, uh, we're both able to uh, read something on Kindle format um, or EPUB format if you, for some reason, have published it only EPUB, I guess. I, I'd like to throw in not just uh, white guys, but other representation as well. Uh, disability and LGBT, all sorts of uh, representation, because not everybody has to look like Stephen King. <laughs> as much as I like his stuff. Yeah, like, like for instance, we might kind of revisit some old... Uh, quote unquote classics here and talk about them, but like I don't think we're ever gonna actually review a Stephen King book because I, he doesn't need any help. You know what I mean? Basically, w whatever you have, uh, especially if uh, you feel like it's not getting the attention it deserves because of those sorts of things, then we would love to see it. And again, dread dot dialectic at gmail dot com. Uh, send us something. Uh, I can't promise that we'll like your stuff, but I think we can promise that we'll read anything that comes our way, or at least attempt to read it. If we get enough traffic where we can't, that would be awesome. Yeah, 
but that's not likely right away. Yeah, and we'll uh, we'll we'll say something at that point. Like our slush pile is friggin' gigantic. All right. Well, for now, this is Michael T. Bradley, and this is Skix Maddox, and you've been listening to Dread Dialectic. <laughs> You have been listening to Ice on Mars.